Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to do a little um, start off presentation just to sort of set the theme, as it were. What we're not here to do is to talk about the Grenfell incident itself. I think there's so many presentations, so many speeches about Grenfell specifically. We're really here just to talk about the aftermath of Grenfell and how it affects us as an industry. Uh, it's going to make some huge changes. I think uh, of all the things that we've gone through in 20 years of business industry, this is the largest incident that's going to make a difference. And I'd like to say finally as well, quite a few times. Okay. Now, if you go through history, if you look at these slides over here, this is about what happened and on the aftermath. So if you look at the London fire, the Great Fire of London, only six people registered had died. I think one of those was actually run over by a car, so it wasn't actually killed in the fire. So a very, very limited death. But what it did do is make changes. And those changes really were to do with uh, building uh, regulations, I suppose, in those days where everything then needed to be made from stone or bricks and no longer wood. And the overhanging section that you see in Tudor styles was banned in London at that time because that's one of the biggest causes of the fire. It, it actually created also the first insurance company, the fire office as it was called at the time. So insurance in our country started based on the Great Fire. Um, and then you go through to Lackanall House in 2009, and I choose that one because it's very, very relevant to Grenfell and what happens, as in the fire went up the outside of the building. And all that happened on that was basically the government said, you'll look at approved document B and other relative uh, documents, and to try and make them simplified. As it happened, nothing actually happened. And then, of course, we come to Grenfell. I think we all know what happened there. And now we're looking as an industry about what will change now and how we'll better our industry. Um, the Hackett review has been finished, uh, and now we're moving on to different reviews and how actually the government will uh, make changes. And this is what we're really waiting to hear. So all we can do is kind of guess at a few things. We, we have uh, a little bit of inf inside information in the way that we're working in these working groups in the FIA, and uh, we'll try and answer those questions. Okay, just introducing who we have here. We've got Tony, nearest to me. Uh, Tony is the Managing Director of Fire Pro UK. Um, we are due to have John Pagan, who's currently driving around the outside of the building trying to find somewhere to park, bless him, and panicking a little bit, uh, from um, International Fire Consultants. And at the end, we have Paul Pope, who's uh, Head of Systems Integration Temp Support uh, for Apollo Fire Detectors. Now, um, these gentlemen are also directors of the FIA, but within their own businesses have expertise in different areas, so I'll try to get a nice array. And we're going to do this as sort of a question and answer situation, give them their views. And again, this is what we think as individuals and as an organisation post the fire, how it affects us. Okay, the things you hear about from reviews, conversations, TV, you hear Dame Judith Hackett talking about cultural change. Um, we worry about the perception our industry has. And before Grenfell, we were probably the safest country in the world for fires. And that statistic has just gone out the window, basically. And where we always look at sort of third world countries and see fires, we almost tuck, shake our head, and then move on to the sports section. Now all of a sudden it's real for us. And it's, it's sad that we have to get to this sort of stage before we start taking things a little bit more seriously. So the statistics of what's happened has completely changed our perception and the public's perception in our industry. And of course, lots of word competency. Competency used in virtually every working group within Hackett's report about the level of the people, what they're doing, what they should be doing, and we're going to discuss those sort of things. Now, I've got a couple of questions I'm going to ask of them anyway to get things started. So, Paul's one for you. Um, I wrote down here, do you expect any changes to British standards following this? I mean, ignoring Brexit and European standards and everything else, do you think there'll be any shift in what we actually do, or do you think it was just one of those things that happened that, that standards made no difference to? What's your views on that? Well, my view on that is that we actually have got a very comprehensive range of British standards. Um, I think if you'll find in there that it's been adapted and over many years, and I think the competency levels of understanding those standards and applying them in a holistic fire safety approach in all buildings is going to change. 
uh, I think that will change because of the competency levels that we expected going forward. The rules and regulations are in these standards. The British standards have been developed for many years and I have to say internationally it's one of the best suite of uh, fire safety standards we have in our industry and I think they just need to be applied by professional people and every building needs to be looked at separately and use the various competency levels within those standards to apply the right evacuation modelling and strategies for those buildings. One of the things I think is important going forward is survivability of fire detection and alarm systems to cope with um, the post effect of a fire situation where it has to control the fire protection measures. So looking at an example of survivability would be a hospital scenario. Hospitals are effectively a staple policy but managed by, by the hotel up to hospital staff. And they're very, very complex buildings and you can't move people out because of their illnesses, either under operations and everything. So the fire detection alarm system standards and the HTM 0503 standards for hospitals look at that very clearly. And there's a lot of survivability for the fire detection system to be able to survive a major incident and be able to communicate effective horizontal and vertical evacuation over a long duration. Conditions. So I think expertise and using the standards as they're designed to do will be a key part going forward. But ultimately there will be some changes, quite possibly, yes. All right, thank you. Um, Tony, what I've got for you is about the competency question that comes up in every sort of section. Um, what can we do in our section of that? I mean, obviously it's lots to do with construction and different areas about process, uh, procurement and everything else. But as an industry looking around the sort of people we are here today and what we're representing, what can we do in the way of competency as in defining it and hopefully making sure that people comply to it? Okay, so uh, in the context of uh, engineering fire detection and alarm systems, we do have schemes in the UK that actually um, measure and accredit the company um, as a whole in terms of their competency. And the two schemes that we have are BAFE SP203 together with LPS 1014. And what those schemes do is um, they'll, first, they'll first of all come in and check the quality systems and the quality management systems of how those businesses operate. And the quality management systems will dictate everything from uh, an inquiry, how an inquiry is dealt with, uh, together with a proposal, how that's checked, and effectively right the way through to how the job is delivered, installed, commissioned, handed over, and signed off. And what the inspection actually does, um, actually certificates the company. And I believe that the gap that we've got, or the gap, the gap that we've had for some time, means that um, the rules can be flouted. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that they are the time, simply because the individuals that are undertaking the work are not actually certificated themselves individually for their level of competency. And at that moment, in runs John, in runs John which is great. Good morning, John. Uh, the gentleman's John Pagan referred to earlier. So it's fresh part from the car park. It's part of his car, which is great. Um, so, uh, going back to where I was, so the gap that we've got, the gap that we have within fire detection alarm engineering is the simple fact that a service engineer, whether he's going to come to service a very simple, basic, two-zone conventional system or a mega, mega complex 36-panel uh, multi-loop um, system, has the, there's no there's, there's nothing in the market to actually for him to be able to walk on site and demonstrate that he's actually competent to do that job. Now uh, we've all got driving licenses. Those driving licenses have got a small code on the back, and the small code on the back says you're proficient to drive either two wheels, three wheels, or four wheels. And that means that you've taken a test. And by taking that test, you then have a driving license. One of the issues that we're facing is, in terms of determining competency for individuals, is just because somebody's taken a test, passed an examination, 
contamination, does that mean that they're competent for life? In my opinion, personally, when it comes to fire detection and alarm system engineering, the answer is definitely not. No. Why? Because the standards change. Technology moves on. Technology makes the changes and the standards follow. So the competency at individual level, in my opinion, is, it, is crucial. It's extremely crucial. So, to answer Ian's question, just now that I've set the scene, the Fire Industry Association now has um, the status of what's called an awarding organisation. And by being an awarding organisation, it means that the training that was delivered previously to fire detection and alarm engineers, together with emergency lighting, suppression systems, is now certificated and recognised by the University of Cambridge to A level standard. And from that, and it was only introduced this, this January, it's probably a two or three year journey that the FIA has been on, but it's the one body that actually offers a competency and a recognised competency, competency qualification for the individual. Now, take that with somebody coming into your house to change your boiler. Now, you would automatically expect that the person that comes in to work on your boiler is corgi, gas safe, etc, etc. Why wouldn't the market require and ask and accept some form of competency check for service engineers? So as far as where we are now, in respect to answering Ian's question, is we've still got some way to go. The market has to adopt this. This hasn't been mandated. It hasn't been made. Um, it is not regulatory in any way, shape or form. But there's nothing whilst we've got CSCS cards. Um, I'm afraid the CSCS card doesn't do it for me personally. All it means is that the guy's got a hard hat, some PPE, and he's gone through some health and safety training. It doesn't mean to say that he knows how to program an analog addressable fire detection alarm system. So, Fire Industry Association now has these qualifications. It's up to the market to demand those qualifications. And it's up to the companies that are the members of the association to send their engineers for this training. So we can change it. We can change it. And it will change over the next couple of years. Thank you. Very good. Uh, welcome, John. Have you got your breath back now? Okay. Um, I'm just doing one question for each member. I'll open up for the floor. So what, one, one for you I put down here. I was showing a timeline of the Great Fire of London and what changed afterwards to do with um, building things in stone and brick after no more wood, no overhanging upper floors. And then I showed Lackenhall only in 2009 and then Grenfell. So we're not talking about specifics, but the, the changes that happened afterwards. So looking at Lackenall in 2009, um, the government's uh, decision was basically at that time to try and simplify the information. What changes did anything, if anything at all, happen post Lackenhall on approved documents or any other legislation? Start singing and fill in if you want. So I'll, uh, you can do that. That's on now. After the Lackenhall the last fire, there wasn't a huge difference in design in design criteria. Uh, the, the issues were more to do with how, how buildings were managed and maintained in operation, because one of the major issues in Lackenhall House was to do with failing the internal compartmentation between the flats and the common common areas, allowing fire and smoke to spread between those areas. So the fire, and the fact that prior to that, people hadn't been carrying out fire risk assessments or premises and looking to check for those things, so the real focus of the Lackenall House was to do with making sure that there are fire risk assessments in, you know, in, in the buildings and that they, they check those hidden areas. Uh, it's a different situation now from the Grenfell Tower fire, from what I understand, the internal um, compartmentation wasn't too bad. It's they were, it's, and they weren't too many failings there. 
the smoke got through and all those areas through to down to doors being um, being open. So rather than down to holes in compartmentation, so it's a, it's provisionally looks like it was down to a number to, to different issues. All right, thank you, John. Well, I do have some other questions, but I want to. No, obviously, this is about you people in the audience. Have anybody got any questions on the last of our winners? Yes, please. Oh, let me give you a mic. No problem. That. Oh, you got that. Thank you. Sorry. Just, just a quick question. Um, is the FIA training going to be mentioned at all, come up at all, at the Grenfell Inquiry? And was Mrs. Hackett aware of it? And secondly, will you be dif differentiating between under-18s and over-18 floors? Okay. So, have I got Sam? Good. Right. So, um, Fire detection, if I answer the latter question first, so a fire detection system, irrespective of the height or the complexity of the building, is common right the way through. So there's no need for, differentiate, for differentiation at all, because um, it's just one system that covers the entire premises. So does that answer the, the second question? In terms of different, because, because the reason why I say that is that the standards actually do not differentiate between the, the complexity and, and what we're talking about in design terms for a fire detection alarm system really doesn't differentiate between a, 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 a two story building. Uh, but it will. Is this on? No. The, hack, the hacker reports focuses on it, some additional criteria for high risk residential buildings, HRIs. Um, I believe, and so it gives a number of extra recommendations for those, one of which is increased competence for people that deal with those type of premises. On the other hand, that was part of her remit, from, from what I understand, so to basically look at high risk residential buildings and what extra precautions might be needed for those. She's also said, so she's given those recommendations, but she's also then said, well, actually, you might want to consider some of these as sensible for all lots of other buildings as well, although that's outside my remit because I'm only allowed to look at HRRBs. Uh, I'll answer that. Um, with regard to the, the complexity of buildings, it's not just high rise, it's others as well. The level of skills um, required by specifiers who specify fire detection alarm systems in those buildings and particular difficult evacuation strategies for those buildings, the survivability performance must be, in my opinion, be highlighted within these specifications. We're talking about high durations of um, survivability for fire detection alarm systems to do its job. Um, and there's not only just fire detection, it's bomb alerts, emergencies, other sorts of emergencies that can occur in these towers, it's other threats. So if the specifications are generated correctly, the survivability statements, and there are standards, there are cable standards, there are survivability standards for fire detection, fire suppression systems, and they're categorised into three category areas, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 120 minutes. Um, and it, providing those specifications are laid out correctly that all tendering processes, all companies that are involved can get involved and to do the design correctly. And also, this also has a commercial pressure for anybody tendering, they're under the same criteria to put in the same system. Lift your microphone up. Then That's it. I think we will achieve a higher level of safety in these buildings. And I, and I, not just fire detection alarms, I actually think that's right across the board. The survivability and evacuation strategies holistically in a building covers all of the events within the building. All of the fire protection measures, everything in that building. The whole lot has to work together. And that's the important thing. And having somebody solely responsible for that entire holistic approach. Now, Jane, Dame Judith talks about the um, subsections of buildings and that the buildings should work as a complete whole system. And survivability is down to subsections as well. When there are partial failures within a building, the subsections must perform. And if they're self-contained, self-supporting, able to stand on their own, that needs a different kind of level of input fire detection alarm. It's about the creativity of those designers, how they put it together, where they put these subsystems that will do a good job. Thank you, Paul. And that's a different level. Does that cover all of it? Is there any bits of it left? Sorry, give me two seconds. Thank you. I guess the, I guess the question is, can 
the FIA or other qualifications cover all aspects of design through to implementation through to actual build because very often there's a disjoint between the designers and the installers and if they both don't understand what's going on or don't understand the implications or understand phased evacuation then the whole thing becomes completely pointless. I, I, I think that's a fair point. I think there's something possibly we can learn from that. Maybe, maybe the courses could be tailored for complex um, phased evacuation and additional requirements. Uh, it's not that we don't have the rules and regulations in there, but is it, is it highlighted enough? Is it highlighted enough that that is a prerequisite of that building? And I think, you know, if we can do one thing, and not just fire detection alarms, I think that covers all aspects of fire safety within buildings, is what we're expecting in the performance. I think that sort of covers overall. what Tony was saying before about having a lifetime um, complication. Things will change, we learn by experience, yeah. every single time something happens, something adapts and changes. So to continue updating it. I think, I think in addition yeah. to that, perhaps the market's got to recognise the, the uh, criticality of what you've Is just that actually worked, Tony, by the way? Of joining, the, how, how, how the whole systems are joined together. Um, the market's got to realise that it, it doesn't stand still. And, and like I said earlier, the technology won't stand still, and, and the complexity of buildings won't stand still either, um, together with the engineering that's required it, it, right across the board. So, so for my part, like I said earlier, was I, I really personally don't see any reason why, because somebody sat on a course 20 years ago, uh, that makes it competent to go and engineer a system in tomorrow's building. It doesn't. So, so I think what, what I was trying to explain was we've taken the steps on a voluntary basis in order to um, get to a position where the qualifications are to a recognised standard as opposed to somebody sitting in a two hour seminar for a CPD certificate and walking out saying, well, I'm competent. You're not. So, so I, think, I think it's an ongoing process, but the recognition is there, the standards are there, and it's how, it's how, how we get them to join together. Absolutely. So basically it's the starting point and what we're doing is defining competency, that's where we're making a starter. Um, can we have some more questions, anybody? S sir. Hi, um, my question's in two parts really. Um, you might be the most competent person to carry out a fire risk assessment, but the main issues that competent or even other fire risk assessors do come across is the control of the common area, the management of the common area. Um, can you see some sort of change in governance in allowing assessors into individual apartments or flats? Because that is basically where the risk is, and that is where you get all the equipment that hasn't been sufficiently electrically um, or annually or whatever it is uh, pat tested. Okay. And the need then is for when you actually undertake a fire risk assessment and you deliver it to the managing agent or the house housing association the desire to get that work done because i've carried out reviews of fire risk assessments on many um, housing associations and the work that you've picked up three years ago is still outstanding john yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd agree, I think that's a major issue. Um, in terms of the actual comments that we put through to the early stage of the Hackett Report, one of the major things that we sent through was the fact that because that's, that's basically driven by legislation. Fire safety order only covers the common areas. It covers the sort of outer half of the front doors to the flats, and the inner half might be covered by the Housing Act, it might not. Um, the external walls, it's debating, some people are debating about whether those are even counted as part of a common area, so whether a fire risk assessment should even look at the external walls, and obviously, in terms of the practicalities nowadays, that's a slightly the same approach. The legislation is disjointed for those for blocks of flats, where you should, read, in a sensible world, you'd have one bit of legislation that covers the entire building. Um, the Hackett reports try to address that, but are not in a kind of way of be suggesting that we just clear out the legislation and try and do it more sensibly. It's more by introducing what's called a joint competence authority, which is involves um, the three different organisations that are in, that are involved in fire safety you know, enforcement of the building: uh, local authority, building control, fire, fire brigade, and the HSC, and getting them to not just review during the design design and construction process, but also ongoing. Maintenance. 
up with you during the, the occupation of the building. So every six months, a year or so, whatever, the, the JCA would get together and whoever's responsible for the building would have to present to them how they believe the building is safe. They, whether or not, but it, it, to be honest, it doesn't really go into more detail than that. And whether or not you would, they would have the ability to essentially force their way into apartments to do an inspection in the apartments because it's the apartments that, you know, that people are, are happy to let you into are probably the ones that are best better managed. The ones that people don't want to let you in are probably the ones you really want to look at. I, mean, I think that's a very difficult area, to be honest, and I'm not sure it's necessarily been addressed by the accurate reports in any particular detail. Okay, thank you, John. We've only got a couple of minutes left, unfortunately, so is there any quick questions we can do for you? At the back, yes? Hi, Steve McKenzie. I'm Vice Chair of Emergency Plans. Hello, Hi, Steve. London. How are you doing? Uh, today's the comments on Moen. I've been working for the past year with the Grenfell community and other impacted schemes up and down the country. As an observation, um, they are very critical of the lack of public-facing commentary input from the fire sector in response to Grenfell and other major disasters. They are also quite critical now of the lack of focal point within the fire sector because it's fragmented across so many professional bodies, the yep. lack of weight of the fire sector in response to the Hackett review, the consultations and the defects that have been aware of for many years. I'm going to put it to the panel, how do we change the public perception of the fire sector? Because it has been damaged, it will come out in inquiry, and the impacted resident communities, legal councils, are, are going to start ramping up those debates. Yeah, okay. Anybody want to say that? It, okay, I'll go in. <laughs> It's, it's all right, Steve. I think we'll talk longer about it afterwards anyway, but the bottom line is there's several areas. I mean, the Fire Sector Federation, when you look at all the trade associations trying to get together, so you talk about the passives, all these acronyms, AFSP, FPA, FIA, there are so many, and I can understand that it can be confusing for people, you know, asking, well, who is actually responsible for these different areas? The Fire Sector Federation is the group that tries to sweep all of that up together, and that's probably the closest answer you're going to get, because there is no definitive answer to that. I mean, all we can do in the FIA, I said, we are 800 members, so we're actually getting quite broad, and we look holistically at all these things. So we can answer most questions, but there's always going to be something outside, because the, the the scope of fire safety is so enormous, as you know, anyway. Um, the answer is yes, if it's quick. Uh, do we have one more question? Or yeah. Hi, uh, Simon Lins from Independent Fire Inspections. One of, the, one of the biggest issues we come across is uh, no as-built fire strategies. The housing associations have no idea how the buildings function, how they were designed to cope with fire, what systems are in there. And, it, you know, it, it really does beg a belief that you don't know how your building should be behave in a fire and then they go and mess the building around and put other things in and totally change the existing fire strategy so there has got to be some responsibility for the housing sector to understand how their properties work and we're not talking old buildings we're talking buildings are two three four years old they've got no information at all I'd, yeah i'd completely agree to be honest um Again, it's something that's picked up in the, in the Hacker Report, the Golden Thread. Um, again, it, in, in her recommendations, it would only apply to high-risk residential buildings. But basically, saying there's a disconnect between you know the information used in the design. Uh, the design might change during construction. They might substitute materials. To, to God knows what changes. They may or may not update the drawings, and then you just get a pack of information that's given through to the the occupier, in theory, under the Regulation 38. But that is, you know, to be honest, it's it's, it's shoddy at, at at best. And so yes, it's it's, it's impractical. We're I mean, we're doing a lot of investigations with actually checking into buildings and finding that actually you've got drawings that show one thing and and actually you pull the building apart and they've used a completely different material. It's um, the, the, the industry right now it doesn't seem to you know the construction and the operation of very very different. You know they they don't seem to feel that they've got to give the information during the from the construction to make it sure that it can be operated properly. I would hope that the Hackett report will. You know, the um, the golden thread will respond to that and um, and improve that. It does rely on BIM, um, which is only sort of being partially implemented, but hopefully hopefully more thoroughly. Um, but yes, and it will also ought to apply to all types of buildings, not just um, you know, not just high risk residential buildings. I, I completely agree. Can I, I don't know if I 
I have to go to the guys in front of the Can I say that we're all going across the FIA stand is on the far wall. Please, if you've got any more questions or continue that conversation with John and the others, we're all going to go back over to the FIA stand by the wall over there. Uh, it says bar, by the way, so you don't have to drink. It is optional. Uh, but please come across and we'll continue the conversation. That'll be nice. Thank you very much.